Well, hello, everyone. How are you guys doing tonight? I, uh, you know, I was here two weeks ago, and uh, at the end of the week, Patrick's like, our speaker canceled in two weeks. Do you want to come back for another week? And I'm in the middle. I'm actually on like a six-week time off from work. Well, not really, because I'm still preaching every week. But it's not really <laughs> preaching when it's into a camera with no one in the room. Uh, <laughs> All that is is a reminder that I'm aging when I have to look at my face on film every, every week. Uh, I, I've been in the middle of a remodel of a house, and we've taken it down pretty much to its studs. And so I gladly came back for another week uh, to <laughs> preach. And the remodel is reminding me of why I'm a preacher and not a carpenter, but uh, I, am, I am enjoying it. Well, it is great to be here with all of you, and uh, my name is Josh White. I'm the lead pastor of Door of Hope. Uh, it's a church that was started 11 years ago, actually. My wife and I uh, really felt called by God. We met in Portland before either of us were believers. Both of us came to faith later in life, me at 27, uh, my wife at 32, uh, I'd been a believer for two years uh, before Darcy became a believer, and she had been a believer six months before she ended up being a pastor's wife. So uh, our, our journey is not a normal one, but it seemed to suit us well for a very not normal city like Portland. Uh, and how many of you, are any of you from Portland? Any? Okay, so some of you. Isn't it funny how every time I meet someone from Portland, they're like, how are you doing? Like, <laughs> and I live in the heart of the city and they're like, it must be crazy. Like, is it like anarchy or like Bill? I'm like, I haven't seen anything because it, it's in a four block radius in downtown. However, the press uh, would have you think that our city is burning to the ground. It's, it's, you know, it's a mess. It's, you know, we do have naked Athena. Uh, so if you don't know what that is, you're a lucky one. Uh, <laughs> For that is the best that our city can offer for peace to the world is a woman spread eagle before the feds naked. Uh, because, you know, that's how you heal the nations. Uh, so, <laughs> but I'm going off on a tangent. Really, this has nothing to do with my message. Uh, Door of Hope has been extremely blessed. You know, when we started the church, Portland was considered a church planning and continues to be a church planning graveyard. About 19 out of every 20 church plants fail uh, within the first two years uh, of being planted in the city. And I know that firsthand in that I try to meet with every pastor that, that plants in the city um, uh, if they reach out to me. And I have met with dozens and dozens, and I can only think of two that have uh, continued uh, to survive, uh, and none that are actually thriving. Uh, I think the nature of my wife and I being from Portland, falling in love in Portland, being from a very, bo if you can't tell by my appearance, a very bohemian background, it gave us an, an interesting connection to the young millennials that flock to inner southeast Portland, which is sort of the bohemian center of the city, although the city's changing very fast. And, and God, by his grace and his sovereign movement uh, through us foolish conduits, uh, he blessed it. And we just saw hundreds and hundreds of young people get saved. Uh, within the first couple years, uh, we just saw this explosive growth, primarily new conversions for Portland is truly a post-Christian city. Uh, most of the people that came to faith at Door of Hope had, had never heard the gospel in their lives. Uh, you know, it's funny, just to say this too, as we get into the message on faith, love, and hope, and what does it look like not only to be a people that are marked by our own robust faith and love and hope, but a people that maintain faith for the faithless and love for the unlovable and hope for the hopeless. Uh, because we as a church are here to be what? witnesses to the ends of the world. And, and right now, in this moment, uh, the world needs something to believe in. And they're looking for, all, they're looking for it in all sorts of places. Uh, and most of the things that are being offered to it is very humanistic, uh, with a very high view of anthropology. If we get rid of these problems, we'll discover that people are by nature actually good. And we as Christians should know better uh, what we need is a low anthropology, 
that we all are actually a lot lamer than we like to admit. Uh, and that's why grace is really, really good. <laughs> uh, so uh, this, is, this is something that is just so uh, at the heart of, of what I care about right now because I think that the world, this is an opportunity for us as Christians to reflect something that the world is gasping for right now. God is utilizing this, this time to purge the church of its false, uh, of, it, of, its, of the things that we put our hope in that actually don't sustain us. And the moment the rug's pulled out from under our feet, uh, we are, we're able to actually see what our faith is really made of. Uh, and and uh, as a pastor of a church uh, of, you know, 1,500 people that I haven't been able to see now for four or five months, I can tell you, I don't mind talking to people with masks on. It's still better uh, than talking to no one. Uh, I, I can say that just the endless emails and the despair and the anxiety and the depression uh, and the, the anger and the bickering even among believers, uh, man, how desperately we need to come back to the beautiful center of our Savior Jesus. And we must be a people that preach Christ and Him crucified. Uh, because this is, this is the only message, it's the most absurd message ever, and yet it's the only message that can save. Uh, and so I want to just talk with you guys tonight as a pastor, uh, as, as a follower of Jesus, and as one who has been blessed with extremely dysfunctional family members. You know, Mary Carr uh, once said that a dysfunctional family is any family that's made up of more than one person. <laughs> uh, and I would say that's true. You know, my earliest memory is actually quite vivid and, and even out of body. I see myself in a back seat and I'm, I'm panic stricken and I, and I've, I got tears running down my face as my parents are soundlessly screaming at one another my mom like a wild animal hitting my dad. My parents were divorced when I was one. And on this visit, my dad, drunk, had put me in the back of his car. And my mom tells me I kept crying, please don't let him take me, mommy, while my dad is yelling, he's my son too. Now, I can see it, but I don't hear it. Uh, what's etched upon my mind are two people fighting over me in front of me, but I'm invisible. And in the silence of this event, even today, I find the emotions of it present and still making an impact. You know, 44 years later, I was visiting dad, this is just last year, uh, in his rundown, filthy, cigarette-stained home in rural Alaska. And between drags of his camel reds and sips of vodka, his greasy hair stuck to his forehead, breathing tube in his nose, which is highly flammable, he didn't tell me that, he says to me about the incident in his crackling baritone voice that never seems to have enough air, I'm still angry at you for that, Joshua. Angry at me for what? That you didn't want to be with me. I was two. I'm still angry. You know, like most conversations with my father, uh, they kind of abruptly end. Uh, and I sat there in the absurdity of those words and at first frustrated that how could this man who I didn't even grow up with, who essentially abandoned our family and has spent his whole life doing hard drugs and drinking like crazy. And here I am in the middle of the winter trying to trying my best to meet him where he's at and be a conduit of grace. And, and here he is chastising me for not wanting to be with him when I was two, when he was totally drunk and acting reckless and scaring me and my mom to death. In fact, I'll show you a picture. I don't know. It, oh, it's the slides. Can you put that picture up, that first picture? This is, uh, this is me and my, and my mom and, and, and dad when I was one. They're, they're, there you are. Look at my dad. He's so handsome. He looks like Kurt Cobain. Uh, and I don't know what I'm looking at, but I don't like it, whatever it is that I'm seeing. But yeah, this is my, my family, and this is my, my memory. My dad, you know, so beautiful and vibrant. Now he's a man who, 67, looks like he's going on 90. And I remember sitting there with him, and, and, and as I, I began to 
to take in what he was saying, the Lord began to speak to me and show me something that was so important. And instead of being frustrated, God basically said, your dad is just speaking out what we all want. He just, he wants to be loved. He wants to be known. He wants to know that I care. Whether he deserves that or not by our basic standards is, is really not what's up for discussion. The fact is, is that he was expressing the very emotions that all of us have. And I had this moment of compassion come over me. And I said the words that I, I can't believe that I would say. And after he would say something so silly, I just said, I'm sorry, Dad. And he said, it's all right, son. You, your old man is usually tougher than this. I'm just having a hard time right now. And I said, I know, Dad. I love you. And he said, I love you too, son. And I looked forward. My dad always has a television playing. It's either playing Fox News or, or this, this classic television channel. I actually am convinced that he watches shows like Bonanza and The Waltons. Uh, and um, reruns, he loves Little House on the Prey, which is really weird because he's a very rough around. I mean, my father looks like a much, much, much more weathered version of Willie Nelson. <laughs> so, and Willie Nelson hasn't looked good for a long time, okay? So, <laughs> but my dad there, we're watching Little House on the Prairie, and I loved that show when I was a kid. And it's an episode that always actually that was playing in that very moment. I felt like it was some kind of portent from the Lord. Uh, it was the, the episode where Pa Ingalls uh, is in a field pleading with God to save his son who's dying. You guys remember that episode? Anyone ever see that? And remember an angel shows up and he, and he heals his boy. And, and in that moment, I felt like it was some strange sign because here I'm sitting next to my father and I remember just praying the simple words, Jesus, will you heal? Will you save my dad? First Thessalonians chapter one, verse three, Paul writes in the beginning of his letter to the, to the Thessalonians, he says, we remember before our God and father, your work that produced faith, your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to think about the strange paradoxes of those three statements that he says about the church, because this is what we need to be marked by as followers of Jesus. He says, first of all, we hear throughout the land about the fact that you have a faith that works, a faith that works. Secondly, that you have a love that labors. And then third, that you have a hope that is patient. I, I really love these ideas because we are told that we are saved by faith, not by works. And yet here, Paul says, you have a faith that works. And there's something about your faith that actually is furthering the mission of Jesus. That there's something about your faith that, that, is, that is a witness to the reality in which all other realities hinge. Which is that we're not talking about a God who is distant. We're not singing to a God who who isn't here, that we are every time we gather as God's people, when we function in faith, a faith that works is a faith that walks in continual awareness of a Jesus who is more present to us than we are to our own thoughts. He's closer to you than your own thoughts. A God who has entered into the human dilemma, who has transcended down to us that the gospel unlike any other religion and i would say religion is something that the gospel is not for religion is always marked by a ladder it's something you climb it's steps that you climb to earn the approval of whatever it is that god at the top of the ladder is but Scripture declares something totally different for a ladder is only seen once in the Bible and that's in Jacob's dream and there is God at the top of the ladder and angels are ascending and descending down the ladder and in Jacob at the bottom and God declares his promises over him. But remember what remember what Jesus said. I tell you this, you will see greater things than this, for you will see angels ascending and descending upon the son of man because there is no ladder 
that could gap the distance between us and God. Our sin has rendered us impotent in that regard. Jesus himself is the ladder, and that is why the symbol of Christianity is never a ladder. It's a cross, and a cross is not something you climb. It's something you die on. And the beauty of a faith that works is that it is a faith that lives in total and continual dependence upon a living Christ who has met us in our dilemma. Look at that. Swallows. Oh, I don't know what you do about that. <laughs> I'm just sorry that one of you might be pooped on. <laughs> We're just going to let that go and just say that's the Holy Spirit. And uh, yeah, there you have it. Um, so I think about this faith and this love that labors and this hope that is patient. And I just want to remind you as we think about these things. This is so crazy. <laughs> just wait for I feel like I'm in the. My wife would freak out right now. You guys, you've seen birds, right? Like, it's like, <laughs> I always think they're sweet until they're not. <laughs> Robert F. Capone said about the gospel, he said, if the gospel is about anything, it is about a God who meets us where we are, not where we ought to be. While we were still sinners. Isn't that what the scripture says? And the lost don't need us to make them feel guilty about their brokenness. I could go up and make my dad feel horrible about the alcoholism and the drugs and the abandonment. I could make him feel bad about the way he lives and the foulness of his mouth and the, and the frustrating things that he continues to say. But listen, my dad is already experiencing the hell of his own decisions. What I'm supposed to maintain for him is faith that works. And a faith that works is that I am able to say, if I believe in Jesus, I can't say I believe in Jesus and believe Jesus is able to save me if I can't believe that he's able to save my dad. And so it is that we have to ask ourselves, are we like this church? Do we have this faith that works? Do we have a love for the unlovable? Are we hopeful for the hopeless? Are you hopeful in this current climate that we live in? Because if Jesus was able to save us, why do we struggle with the belief that he is able to save those that have no faith? And if Jesus loved and gave himself for us, why is it so hard to love and serve those who do not know his love? If Jesus is the hope that does not disappoint, why are we so impatient with the hopeless? This is witness and sanctification come together. Let's consider a faith that works. You know, I, I love that passage uh, in Luke chapter 5 when the friends bring the paralyzed man and drop him down from the roof into the midst of where Jesus is speaking and healing and casting out demons. And, and Jesus looks up and it says when he saw their faith, not the man's faith, when he saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. How does that work? How does that fit into your theological grid? It doesn't fit into mine, but there it is. And what it does speak to me is I can't say whether or not my faith for my dad can get my dad forgiven. But it does tell me that my faith in Jesus' ability to bring salvation to my dad actually does matter a lot. How does faith work? You know, it's difficult to talk about what it means to have faith for the faithless if we can't actually define what faith is. And I have found over the years that we as Christians use a vocabulary that is sacred. I think our vocabulary is important. I don't like it when people talk about we need to get rid of Christianese. Uh, I'm like, like what? We're like born again. Why would you get rid of that? Jesus used it. If it's good enough for him, it seems like it should be good enough for us. What do you, what's your, what's a better word than born again? You're like, I don't like that. You know, those born agains. Like this is, and just so you know, this is what you deal with in a church filled with young people. I like it because they're not afraid to poke at everything. Uh, and I always tease them for being, uh, perpetual seekers rather than eventual finders. And I think that this is, this is what we have to ask the question is, what does it mean to have faith? 
Can we define faith from a biblical perspective? And faith is a difficult thing to define. If I was to just call on one of you to give me a robust definition of faith, could you do it? Let's see that. Let's test that right now. I'm just joking. I won't do that to you. Uh, I like to define faith. I love Karl Barth's definition of faith. He says, faith is this, that I let Jesus Christ be for me what I am not and cannot be for myself. It's a beautiful definition. Major Ian Thomas, a man who I, now there's stinking rabbits out here. Just a group of rabbits right there. It's amazing. <laughs> Remember Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom? That's what I feel like we're in. <laughs> Major Ian Thomas, a massive influence on me, a man who preached in a way where every line was content. Just a hero. I used to memorize his sermons when I was teaching myself to preach. Uh, he says, faith is allowing the whole, the, allowing the Holy Spirit to occupy the whole of your personality with the adequacy of Christ. What a beautiful statement. Faith is allowing the Holy Spirit, isn't it? We are commanded to be spirit filled. It's not you getting more of the spirit. It's the spirit having more of you <laughs> because the spirit isn't a force to be wielded. He's someone to be submitted to. To allow the Holy Spirit to occupy the whole of your personality with the adequacy of Christ. When we ask the question of what does it mean to have a faith that works, I actually am reminded of a series of messages that actually changed my life, turned my life upside down. The first time I understood the fundamental importance of surrender was actually listening to a series of sermons given by a man who was the dean of Cape and Ray, messages spoken here in this room, a man by the name of Charles Price. He's now the, I think he's retired, but he was the pastor of the People's Church in Toronto, an Englishman. And he gave the most practical definition of faith. It stuck with me forever. He said, faith is a disposition toward an object that allows that object to do something for you. It's never what you can do for the object. And the illustration that he gave is that, is the way that we put faith in an airplane. It's very different than saying faith, I have faith in Bigfoot. To say you have faith in Bigfoot just means that you believe there's this creature running around in the woods in the Northwest uh, that actually isn't there, but you believe it. Uh, and, but it doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't change anything. It's an, it's, an, it's an intellectual decision that you have made. I believe this thing exists. But faith in an airplane is something totally different. You're not just saying you believe the airplane exists. Faith in an airplane means that you believe that if you get on this plane and allow the plane to do something for you that you cannot do for yourself because we are bound by this thing called the law of gravity, you enter into a new law, the law of aerodynamics, and that faith in the plane allows the plane to take you from point A to point B. And it actually doesn't even matter how much faith you have in the plane as long as you have enough faith to get on the plane. So you can be sitting on the plane, as Price brilliantly put, he said he was sitting next to a woman who seemed to be terrified uh, of the plane and he said she had mustard seed size faith and he who flies so much he said you know I'm pretty confident in planes and therefore I had you know maybe like a melon sized faith the fact is is we both ended up in the same place but the amount of faith defines the enjoyment of the trip it's a really brilliant illustration I've used it so many times it's hard to even give him credit anymore because I'm positive that he got it from Alan Redpath. <laughs> so, and Alan Redpath has famously said to one pastor that I know personally who went up and said, I love the way you preach. Will you teach me how to preach? And he goes, hey, you know that sermon you just heard? He goes, yeah, I stole it. You should do the same with me. <laughs> I, I like that. It's hard to remember where we get all our sources after years of preaching and reading and thinking. Uh, every time I think I've come up with a creative idea, I realize that I just read it like five years ago and forgot. Uh, so <laughs> this is the reality of faith. Faith is actually not just, I believe Jesus exists. Faith is actually letting Jesus or giving Jesus the right to be Jesus in and through your life. Which means that a faith that works is not based upon your ability, your intellectual prowess. No, it's, it's about spiritual illumination and spiritual empowerment that comes from a person who recognizes that it is no longer I who live, 
but Christ who, what, lives in me. And Jesus shows us what a faith that works is when he says to his disciples, follow me. He never tells them where he's going. Because a faith that works is not interested in what, where the end of the path is. The, the faith that works is, a, is only interested in, in making sure that the Savior is always in focus. That's why Tozer said that faith is the gaze of the soul upon a saving God. And I think that, that this powerful reality of, of, of these people dropping this man down into the midst of Jesus, and Jesus sees their faith. They're so, they're so absolutely confident that Jesus is able to heal this man. And Jesus shows that for whatever reason, that the first thing that the man needed, which is the first thing that they all needed, was forgiveness for the greatest sickness that, that, that cripples us and brings us to the ground is our, is our brokenness, is our rebellion against God's rule. Faith is the opposite of the rebellion that comes through pride, for pride says, I am my own God, and I will define for myself what is right and wrong. This is what we have happening in our world right now in ways that we've never seen it before. I will define. In Portland, you, you, we talk about, you know, the battles over, over sexuality. Portland's like the whole new frontier. I've never seen anything like it. It's a place where people say, I dare you to define me. I don't need to be defined as a man or a woman. I will be whatever it is that I am, and I have the right to define what that is. But the thing is, is that it becomes more and more absurdity the more that we play God, and that's the reality of the human experience. That's why I say we need a low anthropology. We need to remember that we are fundamentally bound by sin. And until we understand the reality of our own sinfulness, as Eugene Peterson said, if we would remember that people are sinners, we won't be surprised when they sin. It's part of the way in which we actually are able to maintain faith for the faithless because we ourselves understand how fundamentally broken and flawed we are, even as redeemed people, even as I preach hopefully a message empowered by the Holy Spirit to you sitting in front of me. It is still mixture at my best moment. As a follower of Jesus, I am still a man of mixture. I still, even when I'm preaching sometimes, wonder if my pants are too tight on my butt. Sometimes on my way to church to preach the gospel, I try to run over cyclists and then get fearful that they might go to the church. I get angry when my alarm goes off and curse in my mind and then ask quickly for forgiveness. The things that we do, and this is why Paul can say at the end of his life, and I would argue that next to Jesus, Paul is pretty substantial as far as a man who gave us a picture of what spirit-filled and a faith that works life looks like, and yet he says, Here's a saying worth remembering. Remember, this is at the end of his life. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, not whom I once was. It kind of blows the Wesleyan idea of perfectionism out of the water. And this is why Paul could write in Romans, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I keep on doing. Who will save me from this body of death? Praise be to Jesus. Faith in a Christ who is sinless. And giving that Jesus the power to live in and through me, a broken, flawed mixture of a man that in spite of my brokenness, he is willing to work through us when we are willing to surrender to him. I think this is a beautiful aspect is that actually the more I walk with Jesus and the more I am willing to confess my own fundamental flaws, it actually creates in me a capacity to love and to believe that God is in the business of saving the worst of people because I know how bad and rotten I am without Jesus. And that's why Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing, which means everything we do without him has literally no eternal consequence or maybe too much eternal consequence. <laughs> A faith that works is a faith 
that allows Jesus the right to be Jesus, and it is played out in the way that we hold on to faith for those that are without faith around us. Because the main reason that you and I are kept on this flawed, broken planet after we have been born again is that we might be carriers of God's reconciling work into the rest of the world. That's the only reason that we are kept here. Why didn't Jesus just take us up to be with him the moment we get saved? Wouldn't that be grand? Because he wants you to participate in his great rescue mission. Because God, for whatever reason, I can't tell you why, is not content to exist without us. It's amazing. Which brings me to a love that labors. And this is a powerful reality because remember what it says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And this is love. Our capacity to love the unlovable is driven by the very fact that we know that it was not us who first loved God, but it was God who loved us, that we were that unlovable. See, some of you grew up as Christians your whole life, and maybe you just simply don't have a low enough anthropology. You actually don't realize how broken and sinful you are. Because I know what it's like to go from total darkness into the light. And it's shocking. It was revolutionary. To go from this wannabe rock star who signed to Mercury Records at 22, who thought he had the whole world before him, and to be married a year later, and then to lose his record deal three months after he got married because his, his single flopped on radio, only to find himself working for minimum wage at a record store selling his own record out of the used bin for 99 cents. That's humility. Learned through the school of humiliation. <laughs> To come to this place in which I was forced to reckon with the fact that my wife was on the verge of leaving me because I was so self-centered, so willing to utilize anyone and everyone to accomplish my dreams because I was the center of my own universe. And it wasn't until God shrunk my world down so small that I found myself in a place of total desperation. And the only thing I could cry out when I began to look for something bigger than myself to believe in is, God, if you're real, help. And I opened up a Bible that my mom gave me when I was 21 and I never read it. And she had written me a letter in the front and it said, Josh, you are so gifted, but all of your gifts will lead to nothing if you don't discover the real gift in life is Jesus. And I turned to Matthew and I began to read through the gospel of Matthew. And it was when I came to the Sermon on the Mount and I read those words, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect, that I realized the great paradox of the Christian life because I cried out when I read those words, that is impossible. And it was like a light bulb went on in my head. And it was like the Holy Spirit in that moment said, exactly. And this is why you need a savior. You see, a love that labors flows out of the realization that God has chosen to love us. You know what God's love is? It's what I like to say is elective. We love as Christians to ponder what election is all about. I'll tell you one thing it's about. Uh, well, I'll tell you one thing it's not about. It's not about who's in and who's out. Election, in regards to God's love, is this. God, who alone is actually free... <laughs> sovereignly chooses in his freedom to love sinners in their sin. That's the logic of election. Even his choosing of us, it's not because he chose you and rejected those people out there. No, he chose you that through you, he can reach them. So election has more to do with the task at hand. I have been chosen that through me, he can save all. Not that all will be saved, but Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And how people respond to that drawing is, is really where the line in the sand is drawn. But we are called to be conduits. Someone said, are you a universalist? I'm like, absolutely not. Scripture's clear. There is a reality that I weep over 
for those that would reject the gospel, the good news. But I don't desire that anyone go to hell. Why are some Christians seem to be excited about it? That they're somehow on the good team. Man, that is a dangerous place to play. Because God's elective work is that he chose to love sinners in their sin. And that is a humbling reality that gives us a picture of what a love that labors actually is. We will not labor in love if we do not understand or believe that God really loves us. That his love is elective. That he has chosen to love you in spite of you. Remember what it says in Psalm 14? God looks down from heaven to see if there is any man, any woman, who isn't stupid. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, and he comes up with a string of zeros. That's, I'm borrowing from Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message. Uh, and it's a really good one. It's one of the few verses that I really, this really stuck with me. Looking for anyone that's not stupid. <laughs> and he comes up with a string of zeros. Isn't this what grace actually is? A love that labors is a love that functions from grace. And how do we define grace? Paul Zoll uh, gives me my favorite definition of grace. He refers to grace as the one-way love of God. Uh, the world doesn't understand grace, but it is gasping for it every moment. For grace loves the unlovable. Grace is by its nature unfair. Let me share a continued story about my dad. So my dad, when I reconnected with him after not talking to him for five years, I felt this deep connection, deep conviction. I'm leading a church and here I am being kind of a spiritual father to all these young people. And yet I have a broken relationship with my dad and I'm embarrassed by his life. And I basically have avoided him like the plague because he, he would wear me out. And I finally reached out to him and we reconnected and I felt this, this deep conviction that I was to fly my dad down to Portland so that my kids could meet him because they'd never met him. Hattie was four years old at the time. And I remember we were driving in the car before my father comes down. His name's Alexander, by the way. And, uh, and, and Grandpa Al is about to come. And Hattie's in the back seat in her car seat. And she goes, Daddy, I love Grandpa Al. And I remember getting mad at her because I'm a good parent. And I said, I'm like, Hattie, how can you love Grandpa Al? You've never even met him before. She goes, well, I don't care. He's your dad, um, and he's my grandpa, and therefore I love him, just like you should love him. <laughs> and I was like, dang it. <laughs> All right, Jesus, you're always right. <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. And uh, so I go to pick up my grandpa or my dad at the, at the airport, Grandpa Al's coming to the house. Hattie is so excited. She waits on the front porch for 45 minutes. Doesn't leave the front porch. We pull up. When I, when I picked up my dad, my dad hadn't, he, he, he hadn't bathed. He, was, he, was, he looked sicker than I had ever seen him. He was at this point in a walker. Now he doesn't even walk. Uh, he's, in a, he's in a walker. Uh, he gets really agitated when he can't smoke. He hadn't had a drink, so he was super agitated. And, uh, and I, told, I told Hattie, I'm like, listen, my dad is a real, Grandpa Al's a real curmudgeon. You know what that word means, sweetie? It means he's, he's, kind, of a, he's kind, of a, a, kind of a grumpy old man. And she's like, I still love him, Daddy. And I'm like, okay, I'm just, I'm just warning you. And I'm like, and when he gets here, do not, do not rebuke him for smoking. She really hated cigarettes. My, my daughter is willing to just call people out because she sees a spade as a spade. And I'm like, you got, you got, can't do that to your grandpa, okay? Because he'll get really upset. And, and she's like, okay. But she goes, does he know he's going to kill him? And I'm like, <laughs> yes, he does. And he does not care. And, she, and she's like, okay, well, he shouldn't. So I'm like, I know, honey, but don't say anything. It's like you're arguing with a four-year-old whose logic is so much better than most adults. And uh, so I bring dad home and, uh, and, Sure enough, there's Hattie. She runs to the door and she hands, she, she, she hands her hand to dad. She opens the door and she says, Grandpa, it's so good to meet you. Can I help you in? And he goes, sure, little lady. And he, uh, he takes her hand. 
My dad claims that when Hattie touched him, he said it was like electricity entered his body. And that is an accurate depiction of my daughter. And, and he grabbed her little hand and, and he kind of weakly got out of the car and I came around and got his walker and he got his walker and then Hattie just held his arm and he walked up to the front porch and sure enough, he's like, little lady, uh, grandpa's got to stop me. I, I got to have a cigarette. And so he sits down on his walker, his cowboy boots and his trucker hat and, it, and he, he lights up a cigarette and the moment of truth has come. And Hattie looks at the cigarette and then she looks down at his feet and then she looks at me and then she looks back at grandpa and I'm like, oh my gosh. And then she goes, I love your boots, grandpa. You see, Hattie showed my father grace. There was no judgment. There was only love, a one-way love. He had done nothing to deserve it. And yet, Jesus said, let the little children come to me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Isn't it weird how we get so jaded? We're offended by the appearances of people. Some of you came in and you saw me and you're like, I can't believe this is the speaker this week. And don't worry, Luis Palau, I do a lot of speaking for the Palau's, usually once a month. And and Luis always like, this is my friend, Josh. Uh, he looks like a criminal, but he's really quite a godly man. <laughs> look at him. Look at that gold tooth. He has a gold front tooth. Who does that? <laughs> like, oh, like, thank you, Luis. Uh, <laughs> but here, Hattie is, is a, the most pure reflection of what grace is. While we were yet still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. Hattie is, is giving my dad a love that labors. I want to show you a picture of, this is, that's Hattie at the age that she was. When, and that was my dad the day that she met him. Al White, look at him. Look at that curmudgeon. I do love that guy though. And that's Hattie's personality. She made that outfit pretty much. And uh, those knee-high <laughs> socks and... I, I think she was just dancing on Hawthorne. Like, she doesn't even care. Like, she's, she's amazing. The girl, she's, you gotta love her. All, all, all fire. Um, finally, we need a hope that is patient. A faith that works, a, a love that labors must bring us to a hope that is patient. Because I don't know about you, are you losing patience right now? And are, are, are you restless? Because a hope that is patient or a hope that is marked by peace in the midst of the difficulty is something that's important because I know that I've begun at times to lose hope for my dad. He's been in the hospital in ICU 10 times in 2020 on the verge of death. He, he, he drinks to the point where he, he, his body begins to shut down. He has COPD, so he can't breathe. And he goes, he, he's rushing. He's on the, on, they'll, they'll call me and say, we don't think he's going to make it. They, I can't even go up and be with him because of, because of COVID. Uh, he's out right now. And usually he's only out for about a week. And then, and then he gets back in and then they nurse him back to health. And my dad actually comes back because he's not allowed to drink or smoke. But the moment he gets back home, he repeats the pattern. Well, I have to remind myself of what does a biblical hope look like? Because it's easy to lose, lose hope. And it's easy to just give up. Because hope from a biblical perspective is not like the hope that we have uh, in our sports teams or, or, you know, in the stock market or in our jobs. And we're seeing that all those things are quite foolish. That they can be taken away from us at any time, Right. No, hope is not an escape from the problems of the world, but an assurance that we can deal with these problems in light of God's grace. Hope is driven by an eternal perspective. That's why it says in Romans 8, 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That the hope of this reality, that the best is yet to come, that there will be a day when faith and hope will no longer be necessary because the object of our love will be before us face to face. We will meet King Jesus face to face. And we're told in 1 John chapter 3 that everyone who has this hope in them, that they will see him, whoever sees him will be as he is. 
That whoever has this hope in him purifies themselves just as he is pure. Our purification as believers is actually maintaining an eternal perspective. And that is what leads us to a hope for the hopeless. It's living with a disciplined hope, which means to be restless with long, holy longing and at the same time peaceful in this present moment. I am restless for more of Jesus, but I try to maintain a peacefulness. Now, I'm intense, so I just had a guy the other day at work hit me on the chest and he goes, you need to breathe more. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you hold your breath. He's like, you, sometimes I think your head's going to blow off. And I'm like, well, that's possible. Um, but I have peace. Temperaments aside, the peace that I have is Jesus. For it says in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, Jesus himself is our peace. He is our shalom. He is our wholeness. In spite of my brokenness, in spite of the fact that, that I am a sinner, which is the very thing that qualifies me to be a saint. For a saint is just a sinner that's forgiven who's empowered by King Jesus. A saint isn't someone who is more morally upright than the person next to them. That's not what we're in the business of. The saint is the one who is the lowest, not the highest. I don't even like preaching above people. I think it's fundamentally flawed because of the natural temptation to have cult of personality. No, a disciplined hope is a, is a shalom that makes me remember that on my worst stinking day, Jesus is crazy about me. On your worst day, Jesus is crazy about you. He loves you. And your trust in him that allows him to be him in and through you. His love will be poured out in your heart. And it'll be so much that you have to give it away. So that you can be filled again and again. And the hope that someday... I will see him face to face that the best is yet to come. Yeah, I don't understand every chapter in the story, but I do know how it ends. And because of that, I believe with all of my heart that God is not done with my father. I think the only reason my dad isn't dead is because Jesus is pursuing him all the way to the grave. And I got the best news just recently. The chaplain at the, at the hospital in Anchorage calls me one day and tells me he's been sharing the gospel with my dad for the last two years that he's been in and out of the hospital. And that my dad has actually been more and more open to it. And what I thought was weird when I was with him is that my dad did seem to have a bit of a working knowledge of the gospel. I thought it was just the Holy Spirit. It was, but it was the Holy Spirit working through another man, this man named Frank, who went to Alaska to be a church planter, failed as a church planter, and took a job as a chaplain in a hospital and came to realize his real calling is that he had a heart. He could never live as a pastor of a church because the people that he likes to shepherd are people like Alexander White. And they don't pay for pastors to stay pastors. <laughs> and so he said, I found my true calling through the painful experience of a failed ministry. And he has been loving on my dad, telling him that Jesus loves him, sharing the gospel again and again. My dad has so much knowledge now of the God. It's amazing. He, he, I go, dad, do you believe in hell? And he goes, oh yeah. I go, really? I go, why? And he goes, because I know so many people that need to go there. <laughs> I'm like, I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> I'm like, what about you? And he goes, no way. I'm like, why? And like, he's like, I'm a good person. I'm like, oh my gosh, dad. Frank needs to keep talking with you. Uh, but just recently... He tells Frank that he prayed to receive Jesus. And Frank goes, yeah, what happened? He goes, I don't know. I don't know if it's stuck. <laughs> and he goes, but you know what? I keep praying to him. And I think that there is a power in that. And I remember I called my dad right after Frank told me that. And I said, dad, Frank just told me that you prayed to receive Jesus. And he said, he goes, yeah, I did. He goes, but I'm not sure that it worked. And I said, Dad, I believe that Jesus' grace is stickier than your doubt. That his love, the whole reason you're alive, you know, is because Jesus is pursuing you. And what are you worried about? And my dad's like, you know, I still drink and I still have all the same problems. And I'm like, I'm like what do you think? Jesus isn't going to save you until you give up drinking. If you gave up drinking, it would actually kill you. So keep drinking, man. I don't think it's safe at this point to stop drinking unless you're in a hospital with people watching you. 
He's like, I'm, he's like, I still chain smoke and it's killing me. And I'm like, once again, I don't think Jesus' primary concern is your cigarettes. Jesus doesn't want your alcohol and your cigarettes. He wants you, all of you, which means your alcohol and your cigarettes. Give yourself to him and he will work the rest out. Give yourself to him and he will work the rest of you out. Isn't that what we need to be reminded of every day? We're constantly coming to Jesus with this or that problem or this or that strength, but what he wants is all of you so that you can have a faith that works, a love that labors, and a hope that is patient. May the cross be our center this week. May we function. You want to know what I think pure church is? The purest church service I've yet to see at a church. I've only seen it in an AA meeting. And the reason I say that, not because the gospel is proclaimed, but because of the disposition of the people that go to an AA meeting. Because they actually function like Christians should function in the church. Because I think the best way that we could start church is, hi, my name is Josh, I'm a sinner who's been saved by grace. That position of recognizing that Jesus is everything. And without him and without one another, we can't do this thing. They come into an AA meeting and they overcome their brokenness by confessing its reality in the context of community. And they offer each other faith and love and hope in what seems like a hopeless situation. And that is where many find victory. If only the church would function like that, that kind of humility, that kind of vulnerability, that kind of hope for the hopeless, that kind of love for the unlovable, that kind of faith for those that are without faith. May it mark us today and tomorrow and the day after that until we see him again. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for its power to bring transformation to our lives. I do pray that this would set the tone for a week in which we explore the beautiful facets of grace that on our worst day, you're crazy about us. And I pray that you would break our hearts with the things that break your heart. And that you would fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. And that you would bring out of the darkness that seems to loom around us the treasures that only you can bring. As it says in Isaiah 45, I will give you treasures of darkness. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have the ability to weave the dissonant notes of our lives into your redemptive story. Use us as conduits of your gospel. For all of us know an owl. And all of us have the capacity to be the same broken individuals that we often pray for. The only difference between us and my dad is your presence in our lives. And I think that that's even changing with him even now. I pray for my dad, just as I pray for those that I don't even know that are represented by extensions of the people in this room. The son, the daughter that's walked away from you. The parent that doesn't know you. The neighbor that's been difficult or the coworker. Lord, I pray that you would bring to mind those people right now whom we are to maintain faith and love and hope for. Because as long as there is breath in our lungs, there is hope. Jesus, thank you that you're in the business of seeking and saving that which is lost. We love you. We give you this night and this week. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys.